Hello and welcome to the Chelsea Showground on what is the most important day of the week for the designers and exhibitors. Yes, indeed. The nurseries and growers in the Great Pavilion and the garden designers have all received their medal results. Now, Nikki, you were out and about in the yep. showground this morning. Can you spill the beans? Oh, can I? Do you know what? No. Oh. I'm going to wait. I'm going to share it with the viewers <laughs> very, very shortly because we're going to be bringing you some of the results in literally minutes. This is what else is in store from the RHS Chelsea Flower Show 2024, an event supported by the Newt in Somerset. Francis brings us the second instalment in our ultimate beginner's guide to houseplants. Today I'm going to show you that where you place your plants is the key to success when it comes to indoor gardening. Our celebrity guest today is actress Rose Ailing Ellis. It's her first ever visit to Chelsea and as a self-confessed gardening novice, she's come to the right place to pick up some inspiration. Toby's on hand with the latest ideas from the small garden designers who show us size really doesn't matter. <laughs> if you're strapped for space, look no further. I'm going to show you how you can have an eye-catching small garden with plenty of Chelsea pizzazz and it can be kind on your pocket too. But first, Medals Day is the most nerve-wracking day of the show for the garden designers and the exhibitors alike. It's the culmination of all their hard work. I was out on the showground this morning to see how the eight sanctuary garden designers got on and whether they struck gold. Finally, you're going to tell us. <laughs> well, this is very exciting because it's Tuesday it's Medals Day, and I'm about to find out how the sanctuary gardens have got on. This is the Boodles Garden, inspired by Van Gogh, Cezanne and Monet, and it was awarded a silver gilt. Well, congratulations, Catherine, on your beautiful Boodles Garden. Thank How are you. you feeling? Uh, yeah, really, we're really happy. As a team, obviously, you aim for the top, but we've had an amazing build, all of us together. Well, congratulations on your medal. Thank, Thank you. you. This is the World Child Cancer Nurturing Garden, designed by Giulio Giorgi, a sensory garden planted into raised beds built using 3D printed clay blocks. Giulio, you must be thrilled. Well, it's very exciting, yes. Yeah. But also a very deep human experience because during the build, we were so all together and we really had a good time. Well, a huge congratulations. Thank you very much. Well done. And we look forward to seeing you back here next year. <laughs> well, Helen and Ross, we have a handful of firsts here with your garden. This is the first time there's been a Burmese garden at Chelsea. Helen, this is the first time you've designed a garden at Chelsea, but what's the final first here at Chelsea for you? First gold medal. Yes! <laughs> Congratulations. I know, I know, we're delighted. <laughs> Are you going to both be going out and celebrating? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> the Kinnick & Co Financial Wellbeing Garden has been designed by Baz Granger. It's an informal, immersive family garden. First time at Chelsea, and you've got a silver gilt. Yeah, no, silver gilt. We're over the moon, actually. It's really, yeah, we're happy. Will we see you back at Chelsea again? I'm back next year. Yes, <laughs> there you go. Committed. This is the Flood Resilient Garden, designed by Naomi Slade and Ed Barsley. It demonstrates how a domestic garden, packed full of ideas and features, can help us tolerate flooding. One of the delights of being at Chelsea is meeting Mr Ishihara. He has the House of Moroto Garden. Congratulations to you. Thank you very much! <laughs> Yay! Yay! A silver gilt this year. No, 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 go to bed now! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 16th year at Chelsea, and it wouldn't be the same without him. Congratulations. Thank you very much! Yay! Well, one of those gold medal winning sanctuary gardens is the World Child Cancer Nurturing Garden designed by Giulio Giorgi, who's with me right now. Congratulations on the medal. Amazing. You must feel so proud. Yes. It's most special for you and the charity. It's, it's very special for us. Um, we started with the charity with a common vision. It was about having a safe haven for children and their families and children under undergoing cancer treatments. Mm. And here we are. 
Yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful space. So how did you go about starting to design um, for this garden? So actually, the very space where we're sitting now, it's the core, it's the nest-like space that I drew was the very first drawing. And this is a place where um, families and their children can rest, but they can also learn about nature. So just behind you, there is a composting basket, yeah. um, a bird feeder to see some fauna, and there is a lot of sensory plants all around us that you can touch, yes. smell. Because sensory is key to this, isn't it? It is the key because it's through our senses that we can connect to nature and we can forget a little bit our daily troubles and just live in the moment. Mm, so a bit of escapism there for the children to Absolutely. be able to just enjoy being children. Ex exactly. Do you know, break down what exactly keyhole planting is. So keyhole design, it means that we actually have the shape of a keyhole, which is a circular shape, right. first of all. And at the center, almost center of the uh, circular shape, we have a composting basket. Why is that important? Is because we don't have, want any waste in the garden, so we're putting all the cuttings in there, and we water the garden from there. So as we water inside the composting basket, all the nutrients, they go and nourish all the plants all around. The, oh my goodness, so it's sustainable, but then it's having a purpose to keep the garden surviving and living. Definitely. And that's why it's so good in countries like... Sub-Saharan Sub African Sahara, countries. Yeah. Uh, very dry countries or countries facing climate change. And these countries um, are actually really connected to our cause since World Child Cancer supports many countries in that area. So which plants would you say people could look at here and say, yes, I could try and grow at home and, and do it myself? Well, there's lots of plants mm -hmm. you can grow at home here in the UK. Some already known ones but are delightful, like this is thyme and it's the silver queen variety. And as you go and caress it, it really, really smells like citrus. Yes. Wonderful. Here we have some Achilleas, Coartata. They are starting to bloom oh, right now. Lovely. Um, some these, wonderful... Are, these are absolutely are gorgeous. This is sedum. Okay. And here you have different kind of sedum, which is an extremely resilient plant that is actually used for roofs as well. But also, I have another plant that I really, really like um, here. This is called boronia. And what I love is that, well, you can actually eat it. And as you rub it, uh, it has a wonderful aniseed scent. Amazing. Thank you so much, Julio. Thank you and congratulations again on your gold medal. Now, for those of us with no outdoor space, the houseplant studios are filled to the brim with fantastic indoor gardening ideas. And we're here to share it with you. Here's Francis. I love surrounding myself with green living things when I'm at home. I find it really calming and relaxing, but it can also be pretty fun. <laughs> Remember that most houseplants are tropical, so they don't like to be too cold or drafty, and generally bright but indirect sunlight is perfect. It sounds really complicated, but there is always a plant label. So a picture of a sun means full sun, a sun with a line through means part sun, part shade, and some are quite shade tolerant as well. But these labels are here to help you, so make sure you read them. It may sound obvious, but our houses are quite a lot darker than the great outdoors. So generally, most of the plants that we buy for our houses will need to be able to tolerate fairly low light levels. Now, a few classics that fall into that category are things like this. This is Devil's Ivy. It's a really wonderful houseplant because it just rambles all over the place and can cope with incredibly low light levels. This is a spider plant, and it's a real throwback to the 1970s. Everybody used to have them. I remember my grandma having them. Um, but they're very tolerant of low light levels. But to keep these plants healthy, they do need to be looked after. And one of the main things that you should do with plants in shade is dust the leaves. A coating of dust on the leaves will stop them being able to absorb light and photosynthesize and keep themselves healthy. There may be some rooms in the house that are in really bright light for all or even just for part of the day. And in those spaces, you need to think about plants that can cope with high light levels. 
in a really bright conservatory or on a windowsill, something like a succulent would be very happy as it can cope with those intense conditions. But generally, plants prefer indirect sunlight. And things like these aglaonemas are such plants. They have beautiful variegation, and that in itself is a clue that they prefer bright conditions. If it's too dark, the leaves will revert back to green. But in a bright space, all those colors will really come into their own. If it's too bright, these leaves might scorch. Bathrooms can be a really unique indoor space for plants to grow in. Just imagine the bath running, the shower going. It can be very moist in the atmosphere in the bathroom. And plants need to like that kind of condition. So things like cacti and succulents would tend to rot in a bathroom. Instead, Think about plants that like a moist atmosphere. So things like Tillandsia, air plants. They have no roots, so they need moisture to land all around their leaves. And not all bathrooms have windows. If your bathroom hasn't got a window, just don't try and grow plants. They do need some light. Now that the weather is a bit warmer, think about bringing your plants outside for a summer holiday in your garden. A bit of rain, a bit of wind, Fresh air, they really will thank you for it. Thank you, Francis, for another great guide to house plants. I must admit, I think I've got over 25 at home. Now, we can always be sure of picking up new ideas for our gardens and outdoor spaces from the talented designers here at RHS Chelsea. But sometimes new ideas might also include a throwback to a style that feels mm, a little bit more retro, as James Wong is discovering in today's Border Trends. You know, I've been banging on about the fact that rock gardens are really ripe for a revival for well over a decade. So it's really great to see that the world has finally caught up with me. But if you look at this space and think it looks nothing like what you picture when you think of the word rockery, that's because there's so much more to this style of gardening than a single outdated stereotype. You know what I'm talking about. 70s suburbia, some dwarf conifers, and a bunch of heathers. But things have moved on. What you're looking at in this scheme is resolutely 21st century designed to mimic wild ecosystems. I love these big monolithic chunks of slate that are all set on their side, a little bit Stegosaurus backbone-esque. And what that creates in between them are little pockets of planting with the ridiculously fast drainage that alpine plants absolutely love. But perhaps my favorite bit about this garden is how it's just ripped up the rule book about what you're supposed to do with rockeries. You've got opium poppies, you've got irises, you've got grasses that really blur the boundaries between a traditional rockery and a traditional herbaceous border. A new hybrid has been created. Here in the Great Pavilion, we have a beautiful example of one of the best things about rockery plants. You can cover large areas of land with them, but they really shine out when a garden is created in miniature. And considering the diminutive size of some of these plants, it's really the only way you can fully appreciate their beauty in a small scale held up to the eye of the viewer. I've really fallen in love with this design because of its forensic level of detail. The more you look, the more you see, and you have to look for quite a long time before you spot this tiny little meanthemum right behind a rock here. What I think is really cool about meanthemum specifically is it highlights that rockery plants aren't just all alpine plants. They can be woodland environments where they like to be shady and cool, and that is a classic example of that type of plant. If you dream of having a garden that is so enormous that you literally have entire hillsides and valleys which you can wander through for days, well, you can have that just by shrinking down the scale. The fundamentals behind it are really quite straightforward. 
If you have a shallow container at home and you fill it with alpine potting mix and plant alpine plants into that, that's all you need to get started. Time now for today's celebrity guest. It's actress and self-confessed gardening novice, Rose Ailing Ellis. Welcome. Hello. Hello, how are you? It's good to see you again. We've met before. Tell me, this is your first trip to Chelsea? Yeah, my first time to to Chelsea. I always wanted to come, so now I get to come, but as a, a special day, yeah. it's definitely cool. Have you seen much already? No, I only just seen the indoor because it's raining so much and I don't have my head that it is. <laughs> so I'm just having a look around now, but I've got an umbrella. I'm going to have a proper look later, but this is the first garden I look at. And it's great, isn't it? Yeah. You live in a flat. Yes, I do. But you have a window. Yeah, that window is my box. only garden. I'm sure a lot of million people in London only have their window as a garden. But, and I've got loads of houseplants, so that is my garden. I so live with my garden. You live with your garden. So it's really important to you, that, that little bit of nature that you've got. Yes, yeah. I think because I'm a, I came from a small town, so I'm more way around the countryside. So London is not like a natural habitat for me. So I fill up my flat with plants and I go to the park as much as I can. I just I think plants are so important. Well, you've tried to grow tomatoes in the past, haven't you? Yes, I, I'd like to set up a challenge every single year. So I have different vegetable or fruit every year. And last year it was with tomatoes. And I, it started off really well, but I didn't realise they can grow massively. And I didn't, I couldn't put them in the garden or anything. So I tried to get a bigger pot and it just got so massive, it reached up to my ceiling. <laughs> and then... Um, it fell, and then I had to tie it up to my um, rail. It was such a disaster. And I, I ate the tomato, and I only got about five tomatoes. But it. you still got five tomatoes? Yeah, and they didn't taste great. Oh, They were really munchy. Were they munchy? OK. Yeah. But this year you're going to try strawberries? Yeah, strawberry. Strawberry is my new one this year. And um, because I heard that strawberry is quite redolent, and they don't get too big, mm -hmm. but... Um, I got them on a window box, I think, outside, and um, I've been told some horror stories about birds eating all your strawberries. Right. So... You have to protect them, then? Yeah. I don't know how to protect them. I don't know. I'm just putting them in the mud and hope for the best. Well, maybe you'll be able to get some tips here at Chelsea. Yeah, I, that's what I came here. I really want to get a tip on my strawberry. That is my aim of the day. And we're going to sort that out for you. Please, please. So let's talk about your gardening experience growing up. Did you ever do any as a child? Oh, no. My mum had a garden. My granddad is obsessed with gardening. So my family is very garden people. So um, I remember, like, mum teaching me how to grow a sunflower and my granddad, he would teach me some stuff. And I think... I never really was bothered as a child, but I realise it is deep down in me and I have a feeling that in 30 years' time I'm going to be an obsessed gardener. So I feel like I need to start now. Now, speaking of your, you know, your family helping you, maybe that's why you love houseplants. Because you've got loads, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah, I've got about 22 houseplants. Yes, and tell us about your umbrella plant. Oh, my umbrella plant... That one, I had it for about eight years, mm -hmm. and I bought it from a like um, a castle somewhere. I can't remember, and it was like this small. And I thought, oh, they look cute. Now it's gone to about this big, to the floor. But I put them in a bigger pot. Pomenier is now growing that way, and then one going that way, and it's just a weird shape. And I, I'm so proud of it. It's so big, but I don't know how to shape it up. It's just going. And so when I watch telly, it's like leaning, <laughs> leaning into your shots. Yeah, and I'm like, mmm. Well, there's another thing we can get sorted for you at Chelsea. Thank you. Now, I, got a lot, I need a lot of help. You need a lot of help, but yeah. we're here for you. Rose, let's talk about future projects, because you have done so many things in the last yeah. few years. What have you got lined up? Well, I got the BBC new drama, and we're filming it at the moment in, like, in Yorkshire area. Yeah. I'm really excited about that, because they um, are the guest actors in the show, too. And it's a mix of death crew. Um, that one, I've got that coming. And also, I've got the ITV show coming up, which is um, Code of Science. So. so you're really busy? Yeah. My schedule is quite mad till Christmas. Well, you deserve all the luck. And Thank congratulations you. with those projects. And good luck with finding out how to deal with the strawberries. Thank you. I'm going to find out <laughs> all the tips and take it on. Lovely so. to see you again. Lovely to see you. Thank you. 
Rose is sticking around for a while longer as she's joining me in today's demo with Jason Williams, also known as the Cloud Gardener. We're going to be creating a lovely summer container, perfect for her windowsill. Still to come on today's show, Chris reveals the winner of the RHS Best Sanctuary Garden Award. Toby's looking at the hottest design tips from this year's show for the more compact sized gardens. And it's Mark's turn to bring us simply the best from the growers in the Great Pavilion. Now, for today's Chelsea Dream Spaces, we have got a knockout. If ever you want a garden to be your own, it's this one. I'm in seventh heaven. It's beautiful. Oh, you look so comfortable. I love it. Am I allowed to come and join you? Of course you are. We're a team. <laughs> it is an incredible <laughs> garden. It is the National Garden Scheme Show Garden, designed by landscape architect Tom Stewart-Smith, who, of course, is a real veteran of Chelsea. Yeah, no, this space is wonderful. I've got the garden tools ready. Yeah. I've got the stove on the go, so I'll make you a tea once we've I done this. I could do with a tea today. <laughs> but what this does is double up as a living space and also a garden shed, so it's dual purpose. It is the most glamorous mm. shed. And I think what Tom's idea of really looking after the volunteers is brilliant because they're going to be maintaining this garden when it moves to Maggie's in a hospital in Cambridge here. Yeah. But in actual fact, they've got their own space, haven't they? Somewhere where they can relax as well. Mm. Do you want to come and join come me? On. We'll have a meander. Let's do that. I am loving the woodland planting. Oh, it's just stunning. And when you think of gardens, I never think of it looking like this. And just walking through the scent that yeah. you're getting. Angelica, there's one thing I would like to point out. Yes. This is from the Angelica family. <laughs> Apparently, it's quite rare. It's tall, it's elegant. It's about your height. Yeah, slightly dark in places, which yeah. is brilliant. Um, the bad news is the designer, Tom, said it doesn't last very long. Oh, that's not a great sign. <laughs> Hopefully, I'm here next yeah. year. Yeah, moving on. But what I love about <laughs> this garden is that it feels like you're in a cocoon. You're safe. Yes. And there's peace with all the greens and then the whites and creams scattered about. And look at these multi-stem trees, which give you such a beautiful canopy. I mean, it's not the brightest of days today, but when you look up, it just looks so gorgeous. They're, like, filtering through. Yeah. And this, what part of the foxgloves we've got here? What do you think about having a very muted colour palette? I mean, the foliage is beautiful. Now, I think it works in this garden, especially where it's going to be relocated to a hospital. Yes. If you have cancer, if you're unwell, you'll walk through this and you'll just feel secure, you'll feel peace and feel actually you can sort of take into account what's going on but not feel overwhelmed. Yeah, it's so calming, isn't it? Yeah. And that's the thing, when you look at it on the eye and we're saying, lucky enough to walk through this wonderful path, you do think, actually, I'm in a very soothing place. Yeah. It works on all levels. It helps the volunteers those yeah. people who are there giving their time, but also helps those people who will be in the hospital as well. And what I love as well, which is really important, that some of these gardens are going to be relocated and used again and again. Yeah, it is stunning, a mm. real inspiration. I can feel my shoulders just going down. We might have to do the whole show from here. Yeah, OK. <sighs> Now, it is time for another instalment of Simply the Best, where our experts seek out some of the standout exhibits in the Great Pavilion. Today, it's Mark with an early summer icon, the Camassia. If you're looking for a stunning early summer addition to your garden, you really cannot go wrong with Camassia for these beautiful vertical accents from whites through to pinks, mauves and deep blues and also various heights. Brilliant for naturalistic gardens, cottage gardens and even contemporary gardens. If you want something beautiful, wildlife's attracted to it, a Camassia will fit in there perfectly. These Native American beauties work really well amongst other plants. You can see them here. Look at this contrasting with this bright orange geum or the yellow of the Baptisia just inside. But if you want it to complement it with colours, then why not go for the Thelictrum with that lovely purple flower? These great vertical accents work in any garden. Camassias are extremely hardy plants. You can grow them in your borders or even in pots and containers, making them perfect for any gardener. Mm -hmm. 
Stella, you hold the national collection of Camassia. Why do you love them so much? Oh, gosh. I am rather obsessed with them. Um, it started about 30 years ago. I just saw some in a garden setting. I'd never seen them before. That sort of visual feast for the eyes, the hue of blues yeah. is what captured me. And I just realised over time how easy they are, how versatile they are in different planting schemes. If you love something, you just love it, don't you? You do, you do. And how easy are they to grow? Top of their wish list is moisture. Hardy bulb was perennial, so unlike most bulbs that you wouldn't tend to plant, sit in heavy, wet, soggy soil, yeah. can I see a crave moisture? So they love a soggy bottom? They love a soggy bottom. Hey. And unlike the cakes you might bake, they <laughs> love a soggy bottom. And the Kamasi have never been as happy as this year with all this moisture. And what's the question you get asked the most by the public? Where's best to grow them? Ah. And what is the answer? The answer is moisture. Even if you want to grow them in full sun, make sure you've got the moisture. And for them to perform really well, get them out into the open right. ground. Well, you know what, Stella? I absolutely love Camassias. I am a Camassia convert. Oh, excellent. I don't have to cook then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're staying in the pavilion now, and I'm here on the Burnkew's nursery stand, and they have won gold medal for this incredible display. And I'm here with Charles. I mean, it's a big deal. 28th win, gold. It is, and it's one of the biggest stands we've done in the 40 years since we've been in business, and we're happily standing in the middle of it and enjoying the gold medal. Fantastic. You deserve it. Let's talk a bit about the plants and flowers you've got on the stand, because it's a mixed bunch, something for everyone, isn't it? We grow a variety of ornamental trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants. We're a, we're a generalist, we're not a specialist, yeah. and therefore we have to attract customers from all types of gardens, and we have to present... You know, here you're looking at at least 450 different varieties of plants on the stand, three lorry loads all the way from Cornwall. Wow. Quite a big deal. Was that what you set out to do 40 years ago when you decided to create this business in a caravan, I understand. We started in a caravan, <laughs> we did indeed. Um, I wouldn't, don't want to tell you what the uh, other arrangements were like, but uh, anyway, we're, we're quite modern nowadays. Yeah. No, I don't think we ever dreamt of standing here and doing an interview like this, but equally along the way, uh, we've all learnt um, a great deal about showmanship and about plants and for every plant you see here, there were two which we rejected as not quite making it on the day. But let's talk about some of the plants that have come yeah. here over the 40 years on and off. Which ones are those? We've got some, some acers down on the bottom corner that have been up and down to Cornwall uh, over the years, uh, probably around about 40 times. They're a bit tacky around the edges. But they're loyal, Charles. They, they loyal. are. The judges didn't know, <laughs> notice the tackiness. But actually, the plant really which sums us up for the 40 years is that lovely embothrium coccinium, the Chilean flame tree. Yeah. Spectacular orange flowers, and I'm afraid the poor tree at home, we've chopped it to bits over the years and bringing large branches up here for everyone to see and say, good heavens, what is that? Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Would you recommend that plant for people watching at home? I think it's a fact, you know, what else flowers as a small tree with that many flowers on at this time of the year in late May? Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you so much for talking to me and congratulations again, Charles. Thank you. Chelsea is like the catwalk for garden design and there's something for everyone. In today's Dear Toby, he's looking at the on-trend ideas for smaller spaces. No gardener has space to waste, and with average plot sizes getting smaller, the perennial question is, how do you fit a pint full of horticultural ambition into a half-size plot? Well, the No Bonsai Garden is packed full of neat ideas to do just that. You see, everything in it has a double use. I mean, the planting in the borders at the front of the garden, well, all the plants in them, they look glorious, they form a lovely green tapestry of foliage but many of them are useful and most of them are edible. The back of the garden, and this is a neat idea to copy, the shelves made from scaffold planks. One half is for display, but the other forms a natty little storage space for stowing your brushes. Above the shelving is another planter with a space-saving double purpose. 
I love this idea because it's actually the garden's gutter. Looks really beautiful. I like the way it gives the garden a kind of a hat effect, like a floral fedora, but it has a purpose as well, because as water runs down through the woodwork, catches hold of this chain and goes down into a terracotta water holder at the base. And talking of terracotta, this is a clever space-saving feature. It's a rhubarb forcer. Normally these things are front and centre in ornamental allotments, but here it's been used as a composter. They simply go in there, rot down, and then feed the borders below. Very smart. Two uses, one space. One of the challenges of gardening in a small space is they tend to be crowded by their boundaries and that makes for low light levels at ground level. But if you use planters, you lift your flowers up into the sunshine. And not only that, you raise up delicate leaf things like aquilegias, ferns and hostas up to where you can see them. You can repurpose any container into a planter. Just make sure there's drainage holes in the bottom to allow excess moisture to escape. And if you're good with the woodwork, well, what about this idea on the Sanctum Garden? A seat that doubles as a planter. I feel very at home here. It's like being in the throne of the Green King. But in a small garden, well, this is brilliant because it's one space, two uses. Catherine McDonald has done in the Boodles garden. She's flipped the usual design layout of having borders around the edges and brought all the flowers front and centre into the garden where you can see them, but where the light is. And there's also pale gravel underneath them, bouncing that sunlight up amongst the blooms. She's also brought in the sky with these wonderful arches. They remind me of space invaders, but they're actually space enhancers. It just goes to show, it's not how big your space is, it's how you use it that counts. Right, time for the demo. I love these. With Jason Williams, also known as the Cloud Gardener. And Rose is here too, hoping to pick up some inspirational tips. Rose, I'm with you. Lovely for you to join us because, Jason, we know you as this incredible gardener who is so creative when it comes to working with very small spaces, including containers. I mean, you were here at Chelsea in, what, 2022? Yeah, that's right. Also involved with the RHS Urban Show as well, demonstrating what we can all do. So, Rose and I want to create magic in a very small space. What are we doing? Well, today we are going to make a uh, an edible container and we're going to inject some colour into that as well. And here's one you've already put together for yes. us. I've always wanted to say this. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> look at Rose, yeah. she's demonstrating yeah. it. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> Love it. So what are we going to do here then? Talk us through the whole so, process. What I've got here is I'm going to put, pop in a pepper. Now this pepper is actually a compact variety. So it's perfect for a container because it's going to stay at this height and it's also perennial so it's going to come back year after. back year after year. I'm surprised because I thought vegetable would be like massive feel. Yeah. I didn't realise it can be in a small exactly. space. So you can get some nice small, ones. Small, this container, isn't it? I mean, yeah. should we look out for anything specific? Does it have to have drainage in the bottom? Yes. So that's one of the real yeah. key elements is to make sure that you've got a hole at the bottom for drainage. But let me tell you, on the balcony, that can cause some issues because if you are watering, that water will drip down onto your neighbours below. <laughs> and what about window sills? Because you've got a window sill, well, haven't you? I have an neighbour. <laughs> yeah, I've got a window sill. Um, but it's slightly tipped forward, so I'm hoping for a bet that no gonna, there won't be any storm that fall them off because um, I won't get in trouble with my neighbour to put a on your head. If you've got like a windy balcony or something, sometimes height is against you, so sometimes you want to make sure that your planting is a little bit lower. Now, in here, I've got an aubergine. So this is, again, another compact variety. But the reason why I selected this plant is because, actually, we've got this really beautiful colour along the leaves, which also matches the, the flowers from the plant. So what we're going to do is then, just to really enhance that purple there, I've got this, which is an oxalis. And now, we normally use this as a house plant, but it's actually an edible. 
So it Can tastes... I roll? Yep, yep. Yeah, give it a taste. Let's have a go. And, are you, and the same soil works for all these plants? Yes. So what you want to do is make sure you've got a really good peat-free compost that drains really well. Oh, that's nice. Mm. Sharp. Rose, yes. when I was growing up, people would never eat flowers. Occasionally you might see them on a salad, but they'd never be eaten. So this... It's edibles as well as flowers. Exactly. Okay. And then just to really oh, finish okay. off the pot, I've got a snapdragon in here. Now, this snapdragon is uh, perennial, so it will come back year after year. And we've got that beautiful purple here. And again, that's going to bring the whole container yeah. together. But that's not for eating? No. Although some people do eat the petals, but I wouldn't advise it. We're not it. advising no. it. No. no. I do your homework before you do your planting, what Please you can do. eat and what you can't. But it's a beautiful combination, isn't it, Rose? Yeah. You said you're not brilliant at growing, but something like this looks so colourful, but also when you come back from working hard, I think, do a little bit of a salad, put something else on it, a bit of a flower. Exactly. and one of the other things as well that I love is including things like this fennel, because as you can see from this finished one, the fennel, just like you're doing now, it adds texture. So it's a sensory element to it as well. So you, not only is it beautiful visually, but also you get that touch and feel of, of the yeah. container is that as well. Your new pet? Ooh, I like that. <laughs> I'm gonna have to take my gloves off myself. Yeah. <laughs> Look at us, we're getting all touchy feely, aren't we? But that is good. This is what gardening's all about. And this is something that we can all do, whether we've got a windowsill, whether we've got a container, we've got a courtyard. If you're renting a property, yeah, you renting, can do something especially. like this. And especially in London, where so many people don't live and don't have a garden. Exactly that. So one of the things that I've noticed is we talk a lot about uh, growing seeds and, uh, on windowsills, but for the vast majority of us who live in the city in these yeah. brand-new buildings, it's floor-to-ceiling windows. So we don't even have a windowsill. So one thing that you can do is you can get yourself a shelf and then on that shelf you can grow something like this and inject a bit of color so if you're growing greens it doesn't have to just be green you can get a bit of color in there too thank you so much jason and also thank you to rose thank you. Thank you. now alongside the medals there are some even bigger awards being handed out today by the rhs and chris babin has been to meet the lucky winner of the best sanctuary garden award and what a winner it is. This is the Burma Skincare Initiative Garden. And I'm just about to have a chat with a one very happy designer, or I would imagine she is, Helen Olney. Hello, how are you? Hello, I am very happy. Oh, I am, yes. We're delighted. Has it sunk in yet? No. <laughs> no. So, I mean, huge congratulations. Because Thank you. this is not only your first garden, but your first ever garden at Chelsea. Is that right? That's right, yes, yes. First show garden. First show yes. garden. Yes. Did you ever dream of, of doing so well? No, not in a million years. But I'm just, I'm so happy for the whole team that's been involved in the, in the garden. I could imagine. <laughs> uh, well, a much earned celebration later. So, so talk me about the inspiration of the garden. So the gardens for a charity called the Burma Skin Care Initiative. And when I first got to understand what the charity do and the way they work, the main thing that stuck out to me was the partnership, the partnership between clinicians in the UK and in Burma and Myanmar. And I had the idea of representing that partnership through a palette of plants that are found in Burma but will also happily grow in the UK. There's lots of striking things about the garden, but the fact that, you know, they're Burmese plants, yes. but actually... I think many of us would recognise them and, and have them in our own gardens. That's it. There's, quite, there's a lot of quite familiar plants and some more unusual ones as well. Um, and we've also represented that partnership with this S-shaped bench. Um, so this is a 28th letter of the Burmese alphabet, La, which with its accent means coming together in Burmese as well. Oh, does it? Yeah. Oh, how fabulous. So you know, if there's any elements or aspects of this garden we could take home and, and replicate in our own garden, what should we be doing? Oh, Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I think water's always a lovely element to have in a garden. Um, it just really helps create an atmosphere. And what we really wanted to do in this garden is... It, it's a sanctuary garden, so we wanted to create a really peaceful, soothing, calming atmosphere. And I think that comes from the water and then the kind of quite shady areas and <laughs> planting as well. Well, I think it's it's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Is it everything you, you dreamed of? Oh, and more, and more. And I've just had such an incredible team to work with and just such an amazing, um, skilled, experienced people. It's just been an absolute joy. So, yeah, it's more than I could ever dream of. Will you come back next year? 
We'll see. Oh, <laughs> we'll see. too soon, is it? <laughs> I need a good night's sleep first. <laughs> oh, I bet. Well, listen, huge congratulations. Well done. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's nearly the end of the show, but before we go, it's time for the Chelsea Clinic, where we answer your gardening questions. We're delighted that Carol has joined us today. How are we, Carol? Enjoying Chelsea? I'm loving it. It's a little bit damp today, isn't it? It is, but I feel the whole show is absolutely on the up. Yes, it is superb. Now, we've been asking all our clinic consultants to give us their budget-busting gardening tips, which we can share with everybody. What's yours today? Very straightforward. Go on. Grow your own plants. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> Short and sweet. <laughs> and don't just restrict yourself to annuals. Try perennials from seed. Really easy. They'll last you for years and then you can collect seed from them too and grow some more. Great advice. And we would like a little bit more, if you don't mind. Over to Angelica. Yeah, because we've got Cat here. There's a follow-on to you, actually, what you just said, Cal. What's your question? And Cat, come all the way from Canada to see you. Wow. What's your question? <laughs> Thanks for having me. What are your game-changing tips for starting seeds from scratch? Well, first of all, try... You must have sterile seed compost. Small containers, half seed trays. Sow your seed on the top, cover it with grit and water from underneath. So, so it, the water goes up, the seeds go down. And then when they've got true leaves, prick them out and move them on and wait for them to be big enough to face the big wide world. Thank you so much, Carol. Right, on Instagram, Garden in the Village has asked, my euphorbia Humpty Dumpty, yes, usually performs spectacularly, but this year it looks rather tired. Can I rescue it for next year? It's 10 years old, it's in full sun and is usually very happy. Well, I think she has done extremely well to, really? to keep it for 10 years. Euphorbia is a short-lived plant. This is a form of Caracas, which comes from Spain, Portugal, around the Mediterranean. And um, if she's still got some good green bits on it, she could try some cuttings. But if you do, Make sure you wear gloves because the sap of the plant is an irritant. Well, thank yeah. you. Quick one. Yes, I've got Sean here and her family. First, we want to say hello to Sheila, Nan. You can't be here, you're 92, but they love you. What's your question for Carol? Hi, Carol. Could you recommend some plants for a new pond, please? Yeah. You want three sorts of plants. You want marginals for the edge. <laughs> you want stuff that floats on the top of the water. So try a small water lily. And then you want oxygenators, things that will go under the surface of the water. That's great advice, isn't it? Yeah, lovely. Really Thank you. Are you going to be doing all of that? I'll try. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, Sean said she might have to get a man to might come in. Man. <laughs> we have got full confidence in you, and as ever. Absolutely. Carol, we've been inundated with questions, but thank you so much. We do appreciate it. Pleasure. Sadly, we are out of time, but keep your questions coming in on our social media pages. James will be joining us tomorrow, won't he? He will be, to and he'll them. also be here with another instalment of our definitive guide to houseplants. Also joining us is Chef Levi Roo. Monty and Joe are back on BBC Two at 8pm tonight with a full roundup from Medals Day and the most coveted award of all, yes. Best Show Garden. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow at 3.45pm on BBC One. Until then, bye! Bye! bye. bye. Lovely advice. These Native American beauties work really well amongst other plants. You can see them here. Look at this contrasting with this bright orange geum or the yellow of the Baptisia just inside. But if you want it to complement it with colours, then why not go for the Thelictrum with that lovely purple flower? These great vertical accents work in any garden. Camassias are extremely hardy plants. You can grow them in your borders or even in pots and containers, making them perfect for any gardener. Stella, you hold the national collection of Camassia. Why do you love them so much? Oh, gosh, I am rather obsessed with them. Um, it started about 30 years ago. I just saw some in a garden setting. I'd never seen them before. And that sort of visual feast for the eyes, the hue of blues yeah. is what captured me. 
And I've just realised over time how easy they are, how versatile they are in different planting schemes. If you love something, you just love it, don't you? You do, you do. And how easy are they to grow? Top of their wish list is moisture. Hardy bulbous perennial, so unlike most bulbs that you wouldn't tend to plant sitting heavy, wet, soggy soil, yeah. can I see a crave moisture? So they love a soggy bottom? They love a soggy bottom. Hey. Unlike the cakes you might bake, they <laughs> love a soggy bottom. And the Kamasi have never been as happy as this year with all this moisture. And what's the question you get asked the most by the public? Where's best to grow them? Ah. And what is the answer? The answer is moisture. Even if you want to grow them in full sun, make sure you've got the moisture. And for them to perform really well, get them out into the open ground. Well, you know what, Stella? I absolutely love camassias. I am a camassia convert. Oh, excellent. I don't have to cut pinch you then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're staying in the pavilion now, and I'm here on the Burnhues nursery stand, and they have won gold medal for this incredible display. And I'm here with Charles. I mean, it's a big deal. 28th win, gold. It is, and it's one of the biggest stands we've done in the 40 years since we've been in business, and we're happily standing in the middle of it and enjoying the gold medal. Fantastic. You deserve it. So let's talk a bit about the plants and flowers you've got on the stand, because it's a mixed bunch, something for everyone, isn't it? We grow a variety of ornamental trees and shrubs and herbaceous plants. We're a, we're a generalist, we're not a specialist, yeah. and therefore we have to attract customers from all types of gardens, and we have to present, you know, here you're looking at at least 450 different varieties of plants on the stand, three lorry loads all the way from Cornwall, wow. quite a big deal. Was that what you set out to do 40 years ago when you decided to create this business. It into a half-sized plot. Well, the No Bonsai Garden is packed full of neat ideas to do just that. You see, everything in it has a double use. I mean, the planting in the borders at the front of the garden, well, all the plants in them, they look glorious, they form a lovely green tapestry of foliage, but many of them are useful and most of them are edible. The back of the garden, and this is a neat idea to copy, the shelves made from scaffold planks. One half is for display, but the other forms a natty little storage space for stowing your brushes. Above the shelving is another planter with a space-saving double purpose. I love this idea because it's actually the garden's gutter. Looks really beautiful. I like the way it gives the garden a kind of a hat effect, like a floral fedora, but it has a purpose as well because as water runs down through the woodwork, catches hold of this chain and goes down into a terracotta water holder at the base. And talking of terracotta, 
This is a clever space saving feature. It's a rhubarb forcer. Normally these things are front and center in ornamental allotments, but here it's been used as a composter. They simply go in there, rot down, and then feed the borders below. Very smart. Two uses, one space. One of the challenges of gardening in a small space is they tend to be crowded by their boundaries and that makes for low light levels at ground level. But if you use planters, you lift your flowers up into the sunshine. And not only that, you raise up delicate leaf things like aquilegias, ferns and hostas up to where you can see them. You can repurpose any container into a planter. Just make sure there's drainage holes in the bottom to allow excess moisture to escape. And if you're good with the woodwork, well, what about this idea on the Sanctum Garden? A seat that doubles as a planter. I feel very at home in here. It's like being in the throne of the Green King. But in a small garden, well, this is brilliant because it's one space, two uses. Catherine McDonald has done in the Boodles garden. She's flipped the usual design layout of having borders around the edges and brought all the flowers front and centre into the garden where you can see them, but where the light is. And there's also pale gravel underneath them, bouncing that sunlight up amongst the blooms. She's also brought in the sky with these wonderful arches. They remind me of space invaders, but they're actually space enhancers. It just goes to show, it's not how big your space is, it's how you use it that counts. Right, time for the demo, I love these, with Jason Williams, also known as the Cloud Gardener. And Rose is here too, hoping to pick up some inspirational tips. Rose, I'm with you. Lovely for you to join us because, Jason, we know you as this incredible gardener who is so creative when it comes to working with very small spaces, including containers. I mean, you were here at Chelsea in, what, 2022? That's right. Also involved with the RHS Urban Show as well, demonstrating what we can all do. So, Rose and I want to create magic in a very small space. What are we doing? Well, today we are going to make a uh, an edible container and we're going to inject some colour into that as well. And here's one you've already put together for yes. us. I've always wanted to say this. Here's one I made earlier. 